Okay, building up towards our proof of Kuratowski's theorem and Wagner's theorem at the same time, we are going to prove to in this video another nice little fact that's going to be useful for us. And um, it's an example of a nice technique that you may be able to use in some other proof that you're looking at at some point. And the idea is, in a proof by contradiction, sometimes it's good to make a stronger assumption, which is not just that I have a counterexample, but that I have somehow a smallest or a minimal counterexample. In some sense, this is the heart of inductive proofs. Um, but in this case, we're going to think about a minimal non-planar graph, like the smallest kind of non-planar graph I can get to. And in a way, that, of course, is what Kuratowski's theorem and Wagner's theorem are going to tell us. Um, but I'm going to suppose I have a counterexample and I want to know like a, a minimal one. And then you play the usual game because if you're going to do a proof by contradiction and you suppose you have some counterexample, the questions you ask are always of the form, what does this counterexample look like? Like what properties does it have? And in the case of non-planar graphs and a particular notion of minimality, which we'll talk about, the answer is it's going to be three connected. All right. So, um, I've drawn here a little sketch of what the proof is going to look like. Three cases. Um, we're going to show that somehow if the graph is not connected, it's not going to be minimal because uh, I'll just take the different components. The different components are smaller. Each of those will be planar. I do the embedding. And if it's only one connected but not two connected, I kind of look at the cut vertex and one side is a subgraph that's planar. The other side is a subgraph is planar. I can embed these so they overlap and that will work as well. And then the two connected one is where the real cleverness has to come in. We're going to show that actually you can get an embedding here as well, uh, where uh, you get an embedding of one half of the graph, embedding of the other half, where these, these two vertices are in the separator, and you can embed them so that they overlap on the edge, and then you get an embedding of the whole graph, and so the whole thing must have been planar. So that's a quick summary of everything we're going to do right now, but we got to build it up in pieces and we're going to need a couple uh, intermediate results to get us started. Okay, so we're going to start with an extension to Fari's theorem. And if you think of the summary I just gave, this makes sense because it was going to depend on us actually finding a good embedding. And so Fari's theorem is one of the best tools we have for giving embeddings. Now, here's the way it works. Instead of just asking for a linear embedding, which is what Fari's theorem usually gives us, we're going to take a maximal planar graph, so a triangulation, and we're going to pick out any triangle. So here I've just drawn an embedding of a planar graph, maximal planar graph, so it's triangulation. And let's say I just pick this triangle right here. It's labeled A, B, C. Now my goal is to find a linear embedding over here where it will look like this. A, B, and C are going to be the outer face and everything else will be on the inside. So for example, I might have something like this. D, E over here. I think this works. Okay, so not only is this an embedding, but uh, those are pretty straight lines for drawn by hand. So I'll just give myself a quick pat on the back and uh, let this sink in. So here's A, B, C. I picked out that triangle and now that triangle is the outer face. I'm asking for more control over the embedding, not just being linear. All right, so how are we going to prove this? So first we're going to use a nice little fact, uh, which is stronger than the fact we used when we proved Fari's theorem the first time. So if you recall, the inductive proof of Fari's theorem showed that uh, we could always remove a vertex of degree less than six do the embedding of the rest of the graph by induction, and then add that vertex back in. Um, in fact, there were four vertices of degree less than six. And um, here you'll notice there's a slightly different hypothesis, right? If it's planar and three connected, which is the case we're dealing with, it means that there's not just one vertex of degree less than six, but there are at least four that I could have chosen from. This is going to give me options when it's time to do induction. The proof here is really simple, and it's more or less the same proof we did for finding one vertex, but we're going to be just a little bit more careful so we can get them all. 
So here is the idea. The number of edges is half of the sum of the degrees. So if I sum over all the vertices in the graph and I take the degree of that, those vertices, that's going to be twice the number of edges. And now if I suppose that there are fewer than four vertices like this, that's the same as saying that all but three of the vertices, or at least all but three of the vertices, have at least six neighbors. So the one half stays, so I've got six times n minus three. And at most three vertices have degree less than this, but I know they have degree at least three. So those other three vertices have degree at least three. And so this gives me a lower bound on the sum of the degrees. But if I were to expand this out, what do I get? I get inside here, I get 6n minus 18 plus 9. That's 6n minus 9. 3n minus like four and a half, which of course is strictly greater than 3n minus 6, but that's not possible because planar graph has at most 3n minus 6 edges, right? Maximal planar graphs had exactly 3n minus 6. And here I had somehow more than that, uh, which is impossible. So that implies that the graph was not in fact planar. And so that's a contradiction because we assumed it was planar. So uh, this is gonna give us our four We'll call these the low degree vertices, vertices of degree less than six. So now uh, I wrote it here, but here's the, I'll say it in words, the main idea is that in the proof of Far East theorem, when it was time to remove a vertex, well, we just assumed we had one. Now we assume we have four and we can make sure that we choose one that was not A, B, or C. So it means that when we do our induction, by induction, we suppose that there exists an embedding with a given triangle as the outer face. And, uh, and since when we remove a vertex, we didn't remove A, B, or C, we still have that triangle A, B, C. So inductively, we embed that as the outer face. And then the new vertex that gets added um, is added somewhere on the inside. And so we still have A, B, C as the outer face. Okay, so that's, um, that's how we get our our extension to Fari's theorem. And now um, we can also prove this lemma. Right? So this is the main one. This is the one that was supposed to be the main event here. It goes as follows. So I'm going to say that if every minor of G, other than G itself, so G is a minor of itself, but every other minor, every proper minor you might say, if, if every one of them is planar, then G has to be three connected. So this is the sense in which I was calling it minimal before. Okay, so it doesn't have any minors that are not planar, even though it's, it itself is non-planar. So if that's the case, then G has to be three connected. Well, the first case, if G is not connected, I call this case zero, right? It's like zero connectivity then uh, I, what I can do is I can just look at the different components and embed them all separately. Now each one of these components is a subgraph, in fact the proper subgraph, and therefore it's a minor, different from G, and therefore they're planar. And since each one is planar, I can embed them separately. Hopefully it was clear that when I write this, I mean that G itself is, it's, is non-planar. So the, this gives me an embedding, which implies that G is planar because I had an embedding, which is a contradiction, right? We said it was not. Now, the next case is maybe it's connected, but it's not too connected. So there's some single cut vertex. Well, um, this case, Actually, the proof for this case is pretty much identical to the next case, um, but we'll do it in two steps so that you can kind of see this uh, idea in action. What we'll do is we'll take this graph, we'll contract all of B to, to the one vertex V. So that will give us a minor A prime. I've labeled it here, right? It's just, in fact, it's just this subgraph. And uh, I can do the same to B, where I take B and I contract all of A to the vertex V and I get B prime. Now, both of these are proper minors. That is, they're minors of G, but they don't 
equal g, and so both are planar. Now, we can embed both a prime and b prime so that this vertex v is on the outer face. And we can do that using this stronger Fari's theorem we just used. Now, if v is on the outer face, and in fact they're on a triangle, then uh, I can just overlap the vertices v. I can kind of glue these two embeddings together. So if I glue the embedding of a prime and the embedding of b prime, as I embed them next to each other so they overlap at v, then I actually have an embedding of g. That, again, would imply that g is planar. I know it's planar because I just constructed an embedding, which, again, is a contradiction. We assume g was not planar. All right, so we're almost there. In fact, we're just going to do this same proof now for the two-connected case. So if g is two-connected but not three-connected, that means I can find this separator here of size 2. As before, I take a prime as a minor of g. Let me just remind you this. This a prime is a minor of g, and I formed it by contracting all of b to this one vertex u. And similarly, I have b prime is also a minor of g, and I contract all of A to U to form B prime. In pictures, you might see these as follows. So uh, if this is U and V, all of B got contracted to basically just one edge. If there wasn't an edge here, then uh, I could have just taken one of U or V as the separator. Right? So there must have been some path from U to V in B, and that becomes this edge. And then the rest of the graph is here. So this is what a prime looks like. B prime similarly has the edge u v and all of this. Now both of these are planar because both of these are minors of g and they are not all of g. So both are planar and we can use our stronger version of Fari's theorem to embed them so that this edge, uv, which they both have, is an edge on the triangle on the outer face. And so, as a result, we can embed them so that those edges overlap. Right? You can think of it as me taking this graph here, just moving it and plopping it down right on top so that u matches up with u and v matches up with v. All right, so what does that give us? Well. Gluing them together gives an embedding of G. But if G has an embedding, then it's planar. And again, we get exactly the same contradiction. And so we, again, uh, conclude that this case is also a contradiction. So uh, G has to be at least three connected because two connectivity was not enough. One connectivity was not enough. Zero connectivity was not enough but three connectivity must be true. And so this is exactly the lemma we wanted to prove. All right, all right, so uh, finally, in the next video, we'll get to put this together. We'll use this um, in a nice way to finally give a proper proof of Kuratowski's theorem and Wagner's theorem. And, uh, and so get excited, see you soon.